Sorry I've not posted anything recently. It's been a bit busy. Get away, cat. Just couldn't recover. But I promise, one day that will all be explained. But it's December, it's been a really rocky market this month. It's been a rocky year for some people. But it's now time to look at the year ahead and I'm gonna figure out how I'm going to invest in 2022. Welcome back everyone, my name's Paul, I'm brand new to investing and I've started a dividend reinvestment portfolio on Trading212. And this month I crossed another milestone at 40,167 and I've barely deposited anything into this portfolio. That's another story for the future as well. Not giving away much today, am I? And then we had this little dip which almost brought me to 37,000. But then there was a quick recovery and now we are back up to uh, stupid, stupid overvaluations again. Ball trap. Many blamed it on this new Omicron variant, but I think most people saw through that very, very quickly. It seems the only person that is still scared is this guy. Even Anton Decker ahead of the Prime Minister, sorry. Personally, the only thing that's got me even slightly worried about the markets is this guy, Jay Powell. The guy's flip-flopping around like he's my missus choosing what's for dinner tonight. Oh, I think I might fancy some tapering. Or maybe I'm thinking about, think about, thinking about raising interest rates. <laughs> It turns out the only part of inflation is transitory was the word transitory. And it's very possible if the US raises rates, the European Central Bank and the UK are going to raise them too. And I had to ask the question because I didn't know, is inflation bad? And the answer is no, inflation inherently isn't bad. Slow inflation at about 2% or so is actually really good. It's a good sign that the country that you're in is growing. Companies will raise their prices when things are going good and consumers are willing to pay that little bit more for them. When there's more demand, they can hire more workers, increase wages, and therefore raise prices again. Then people buy more and spend more, and that creates a nice circle of life. Now, Inflation's bad when prices go up, not due to wage increases, but because of other things like supply shortages and artificial manipulation. And then we end up in really dangerous recessions where people can't pay their mortgages. Everyone sells their stocks so they don't get made homeless. Uh, yeah, can I get one emergency fund, please? And we end up going through this bull trap all the way down to the valley of despair. There's reasons to think this might not happen. Big companies hate losing equity as much as we do, which is why we're seeing companies saving a little bit of money so they can raise some wages next year. My part. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part too. <laughs> but there's no doubt that this level of extension is scary. And you know what's worse? This one. Because the Nasdaq is again following a very similar pattern to 2000. It's just doing it on a far, far, far bigger scale. And in this crap situation of rising interest rates, not only will money come out of the market to pay bills and pay off mortgages, smart money moves out of stocks and into bonds. In this situation, generally treasury bond rates go up. And when bond yields start returning something reasonable like three or 4%, that's when you start to see money come out of stocks and into bonds because the risk for return is much lower. Long term, bond rates have been falling. It's almost like bonds are dead. But as recently as 2019, treasury yields were 3%. And I can't lie, that risk-free rate to me right now is really tempting because my financial plan to financial independence is only 10 years long and assumes a 4% growth rate. But in stocks, that still contains an element of risk. I could get more, I could end up getting 20, 30%. Yeah, right. But while it's unlikely, I could also make 1%. With a fixed 10-year treasury bond at 3%, I could take all of my money out of stocks and put it into 10-year treasuries, and within 15 years, I will reach my financial freedom number, as it were. This de-risks me completely and still meets my goal. And I wonder how many millionaires and billionaires there are out there who are willing to take a portion of their stockpile out and put it all into bonds when there's a good risk-free rate. And just today, on December the 9th, the Bank of England have now decided that they will raise rates in January. They're not even completely sure if they will change it in December yet. And that could mean that my mortgage rate now goes from 2% to 4%. That's doubling my interest payments on my mortgage. So it could mean for me that rather than putting that money into stocks, I should now start paying off my mortgage because I'm still going to get a guaranteed compounded rate of return. But none of this has happened yet and not me, not Jerome Powell, not Andre Jick or Graham Stephan can predict it. So for the moment, my investment thesis stays exactly the same. If I decide I've got no interest in stocks anymore, I will be buying index funds. 
But for now, I really enjoy finding excellent companies at reasonable prices. And I've made quite a few changes to my portfolio recently. Currently stands at 4144, and I can say this every week, that's more money than I've ever seen in my lifetime. Remember, I am brand new to this, and as of two years ago, I had nothing. I wasn't ridiculously in debt like some people, probably only like 10 grand or something, but I had nothing in savings and I had never heard of investments before. So in 2019, I went out and I learned. And I found the best way for me to make money in the stock market is through dividend growth investing, buying high cash flow, well-run businesses that give back to shareholders. And in a strange one for me, I recently sold Johnson & Johnson, one of the biggest dividend growth companies in the world. And I think this video is going to be really long, so I'll fly through the reasons why I did this. Basically, Johnson & Johnson is spinning off its really small, non-growth part of its business. In the end, with Johnson & Johnson, you're going to end up with a pharmaceutical and robotics company and Unilever. And no one seems to want Unilever anymore. And with what happened to Realty Income and its office spin-off recently, I don't want to be in that situation again with Johnson & Johnson. I don't want to end up with one company that no one wants and everyone is trying to get out of and it's a big race and it's all messy. On the other side, the pharmaceutical company does have a pretty good pipeline, but on the robotics side, which is supposed to be its massive growth business, Johnson & Johnson has recently come out and said that that is now delayed by two years. A lot of the fundamentals here that are changing aren't quite adding up for me, and I want to come away and out while I re-decide what I'm going to do with Johnson & Johnson. So I've basically put it on the subspenser this time. Once the deal has gone through and once we've analyzed everything properly after the merger, I'll reconsider getting back into Johnson & Johnson just as this new company. And I've used the money from the sale of Johnson & Johnson to take a bit of a contrarian risk on Discovery. The day before I bought Discovery, it released its S4 filing for the merger between HBO Max, which is coming from <laughs> along with a shit ton of debt, and delivering this big merger between Discovery and HBO Max. I read it. It's really long and it was really painful, only to find out that it really tells us nothing that isn't already in the public domain. The only thing that might not have been known is that Jason Keeler, who's the current head of HBO Max, has about six months to decide whether he's going to stay or whether he's going to go, or if he's going to get fired, and he's entitled to quite a big severance package. Other than that, we know that HBO and Discovery are going to merge, and they're going to bring on about $43 billion in debt. That's the elephant in the room right now, and that's what's led to this decline in price recently. It simply comes back to interest rates. If interest rates are going to rise, it's going to be harder for companies with a lot of debt probably going to struggle. That's why AT&T, which is my worst performing stock, has fallen a lot recently. And when I say AT&T is not doing very well, it could be worse. But Discovery is a step out of my comfort zone and with all these growth stocks that are starting to come into really reasonable value at the moment, it might be time for me to shift very, very slightly towards growth because of how cheap everything is getting. Soon those massive darling growth stocks of 2020 are going to look pretty good. And the time to be buying those stocks is when everybody else hates them. So I'm keeping my eyes on a few companies like Melly, PayPal, Teladoc, and maybe even a bit of Roku. But with Discovery, over the past 15 years, you've got a stock that's only made 6.4% every year. This is way behind the S&P 500's 9.07%. Quantitatively, this business is an awesome stock, and I'm not going to do much quantitative stuff in here. I'm just going to show you the revenue growth, which is pretty exceptional. What I need to look for because this company is now going to be a highly leveraged growth stock is how it's going to get there and where the value is going to be added to that price. From Discovery side, we've got an excellent direct to consumer base. Customers who buy Discovery Plus are extremely happy with their service. It's fast, it works, and it's got great shows that they love. So all that amazing content from HBO is now coming on to this new service, which is far better than what it had when it was with AT&T. And from HBO's side, we've recently learned that this cannibalization idea is actually untrue, and it's a far better performing growth stock than Netflix is. Netflix currently has a 23.8% increase year on year for its average revenue per user, but just the direct-to-consumer part of HBO Max is growing at 39% year on year. And then we have to figure out how HBO Max and Discovery can keep growing. Where's the extra value here that's going to raise that share price? Well, Netflix currently has 214 million subscribers. Amazon Prime has 175 million subscribers. And you've got Tencent and I'm looking for Disney at 118 million subscribers. 
All of these companies currently deliver their entire service worldwide. And HBO Max, all the way down here with 69.4 million subscribers, only comes out of the United States, the Nordics, Spain and Andorra. Andorra? Why did Andorra get it before the UK? But it's coming to the UK soon, which is going to add quite a few more million subscribers. The fact of the matter here is that HBO and Discovery still have a lot more countries to get into and it isn't going to take them long to get there. You realise that HBO Max owns Studio Ghibli and it isn't on show in Japan. You know what is in Japan though? Discovery Plus. And that's a very biased and positive view of Discovery Plus and HBO Max, but there are a few downsides. And I think people are underappreciating the ability for HBO Max and Discovery to pay off that debt. HBO Max is coming from AT&T, which got itself into a lot of debt. But Discovery Management has an excellent history of deleveraging itself. It really does a lot of good work on moving about that money. And going into this merger, Discovery has already started paying off its debt, reducing from five times net leverage all the way down to three times. So this streaming service is now going to come together a lot more leaner than expected. The debt problem is still there though, and they will need to work very, very hard to reinvest a lot of their money back into content. The difference between HBO and Netflix though, is that HBO has a lot of very meaningful IP. Netflix barely has any, and it has to spend a lot of money trying to generate a lot more IP. I do firmly believe though that HBO and Warner Brothers have a lot behind them, and I've kind of seen that from first-hand evidence recently. So you've got Discovery growing revenue at like 25% a year, which is more than Netflix. You've got HBO Max growing at nearly 40% a year. And between them, you've got two companies that are seriously undervalued right now. If Discovery was to return to its normal price to earnings ratio of 22, you've got a 33% upside year on year. If you want to bring that down and half that to just a 15 PE, remember this is a 40% year on year growth company in an industry which is largely taking over the world. You're still, even at a terminal value of 15 in five years, gaining 22% year on year. That people is what we call a margin of safety. If it goes really wrong and sees absolutely no growth, well, you're gonna earn 7% a year, which according to Vanguard is still gonna beat the market. So that's my portfolio right now. I'm still adding to Bristol Myers Squibb. I'm still adding to Rio Tinto a little bit. And of course, I'm still building a little bit in my position of AT&T to transfer over eventually into Discovery. And because the US markets have just opened up, I'm now at 40,015 for the month of November, and I guess we're now halfway into December, right? Thank you very much for watching, everyone. Don't forget to check me out on Instagram where you can see what I'm buying pretty much in real time. And of course, if you enjoyed this video, please feel free to like, subscribe, and invest. Ready, go. Thanks very much for watching. <laughs>